The NDAA authorizes the military to detain American citizens until the end of hostilities. Well, when's that going to be? If we're having a war on an idea, that'll never end, which may be their point. With a war on an idea that means indefinitely, no sense of provision, the entire destruction of, of the rights that are granted by the Creator and or just a part of our nature and protected by the very documents they put their hand on the Bible and swear to uphold is accomplished by this outrage right here. Next slide, please. Okay. Since the belligerent or terrorist act is not defined in the NDAA, we must look to the government to define it for us. Oh, what could possibly go wrong here? <laughs> All right. So, uh, many of you will, re will re recall, uh, both with the fusion centers and also with um, this information that came up from the uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance, part of the uh, Department of Injustice and the FBI, um, they were saying, well, gee, uh, for instance, if somebody went, if somebody went to a military surplus store, um, what should the people think, or, or any uh, or, um, vendor of, of goods, who would be suspicious? Who should we be able to look for? Because after all, uh, Janet uh, Napolitano, the not-so-great Napolitano, as opposed to Judge Andrew Napolitano, who's the great Napolitano, she, uh, she, she said, see something, say something. So what should they look for? All right. Well, they included things, for instance, uh, of people that were really intent on maintaining their privacy. Oh, gee, shocking that somebody would want to maintain their privacy. Or they might want to pay with cash. For, for crying out loud, I mean, can, this, this is outrageous. Uh, they, they, you know, or, or they might make some extreme comments or something, you know, of, of that nature. And who's going to de define what extremists are? There are some other interesting things here if we go to the next slide. Uh, yes, if the person is, uh, has a view that's nationalistic as opposed to universal or international, anti-global, suspicious of centralized federal authority, well, for crying out loud, Patrick Henry said we should be suspicious of centralized federal authority. If we're not, we're not patriotic Americans. What the hell's the matter with these people? <laughs> but we already know what's the matter with them. Thank you. you are a wonderful group, by the way. I should point that out. Nobody else has told you. You people are outstanding. All right. So, now, what, what, what if, um, or if you're reverent of individual liberty? or you believe in conspiracy theories that involve a grave threat to national sovereignty or personal liberty, or if you are uh, single-issue oriented, all, all including uh, being anti-Castro or, or anti-abortion, uh, you know, th these things would really ca cause suspicion among the authorities. Uh, next page, please. Okay, and Fox News had this thing about um, warning signs for the police according to the authorities. That include, uh, said people likely to co uh, commit violence will speak against government or blame government for their perceived problems or uh, do unusual or extreme actions that catch the attentions of others. Well, well what qualifies as an unusual or extreme action? Is, is, is it speaking out in a protest? Is it doing political street theater? Uh, who is it all? I'm sorry, what's that? It's whole group. Yes, whole group, yeah. Uh, so, again, I mean, th th this is really uh, quite disturbing and contrary to everything that should be happening. And uh, lastly, oh, if you're active online to show extreme views or connect with others, uh-oh. All right. <laughs> Let me go to the next page here. All right. So does this apply to American citizens? Now, we should first of all point out that, that the rights we have, are, and when they're protected by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the whole point there is not that they're carving out a separate group of people called citizens that get rights that are granted to them by their government. No. The rights are pre-existing. According to Thomas Jefferson and our other great philosophers, in the Declaration of Independence, the only reason to have government is to protect the liberty, to protect the rights which are pre-existing. All right, and, and so when you read the Bill of Rights, what it does is restrain the general government, or what we call the federal government, that branch of our federal union. That's very important to recognize we have a federal union. It's not one nation. It was sovereign states that were created by their people to protect the people's rights that came together, formed that general government, formed that federal union. All right, and so they are proscribed, that is the federal government in Washington, D.C., proscribed from these activities by the Bill of Rights. But uh, nonetheless, e even American citizens are at risk now because in Section 1022 under covered persons, uh, there's a requirement in paragraph 1 that applies to any person whose detention is authorized under Section 1021. So what is the requirement? Okay, in, in Section 1021, uh, paragraph A, subclause 1, in general, except as provided in paragraph 4, which I think gives them, a, I was watching Chris Ann Hall's description of this, it basically gives them out to do whatever they want. The armed forces of the United States, the armed forces of the United States shall hold the person described in paragraph two who is captured in the course of hostilities, authorized by the AUMF in military custody, pending disposition 
under the law of war. Very key words here. Next, please. All right. So, does it apply to us? Well, shall hold means must hold. Does it apply to us, United States citizens? The requirement to detain a person in military custody under this section, the requirement does not extend to citizens of the United States. The requirement. Removing the requirement shall hold means the U.S. military may hold. So it doesn't say they can't do it. It doesn't forbid it. Making the requirement not extend to American citizens gives the U.S. military the option. It does not prohibit U.S. citizens from being detained by the United States military under Section 1022. The words pasti comitatus might come to mind for some of you. Uh, so NDAA Section 1022 in um, Clause A, Subsection 1, non-citizens, it says they shall hold non-citizens. U.S. citizens in uh, Clause B, Subsection 1, they may hold. That indicates we're all vulnerable. We are all at risk. Okay. So, do we really want to give the president this kind of power? Do we want to give any president this kind of power? Does it matter what the person's name is or the political party label? Would free people ever give one individual this kind of power? And I think I already know what the answer would be from all of you. Uh, does this uh, undermine our rights, our constitutionally protected rights? Uh, and, and indeed it does. And you can see a whole listing of them. Um, Article 1, Article 2, uh, Section 2, Article 3, Section 3, the definition of treason, which is very interesting, which is to make war against the states, plural. Give aid and comfort to their enemies, plural. Because again, the states formed this federal union. They were most concerned with somebody trying to get more power and attack the states who were there to protect the people and to create a situation actually like, like we have today. But it does say that if you are accused of treason, there have to be at least two witnesses and it has to be an open court with, or confession, that sort of thing. Uh, so th this gets rid of that. It, the right to bear arms, to be secure in your persons and papers, the right to due process or speedy trial or cruel and unusual punishment, all those things are out. Because if, if they can uh, uh, have the military arrest you, you're not going to get that kind of a trial that you would get in a civilian court. And if they can arrest you and hold you under the law of war, that means it's open season. They could even have you sent overseas, you know, rendition to one of those countries overseas, and some of which are, are previous uh, coalition partners, some of which still are coalition partners, and, and do things that are shocking to the conscience as well as horrible to the uh, individual that endures them. All right. So, uh, even now, even though the NDA directly violates at least six amendments in the Bill of Rights, it's not the most dangerous part of this law. And I just referred to what is the most dangerous part. It's the point where it says, for disposition under the law of war. Uh, next slide, please. When they, when they <coughs> use the law of war, that means no constitutional protection of your rights at all. And, and they're doing this in a way under this so-called war on terror with the AUMF, where they have no sunset provision. We, we have seen, if you study American history, you can see the long train of abuses that grows and grows and grows, uh, particularly since the 1860s, but there's, there's no end to it. And it seems to only accelerate, regardless of political party, regardless of who's in office. And what this law of war uh, doctrine does, it governs what the country can do. You have no Second Amendment rights, for those that are worried about that, no Fourth Amendment rights, no constitutional rights at all. It removes the Constitution entirely. No protections for the people. So what they have done, in their usual fashion, by couching it with some other verbiage, and with their cowardly abdication of their duties, they have taken the U.S. Constitution, once the supreme law of the land, and replaced it with the law of war. It's an alarming and outrageous situation. All right, so what should we do about it? Well, uh, talk to our friends and family about the NDAA and encourage them to look it up themselves so they can read it. And you can, there are, of course, videos where people are discussing this, uh, which are very good. Uh, also, local lawmakers, and we, we have one today that's helped us take a stand here with the state of Michigan. We talked about that. And look at ways to nullify the NDAA, uh, which is very important. And the concept of nullification was Thomas Jefferson's rightful remedy. When the federal government oversteps its bounds, the idea is, well, gee, do, do we have to submit? Or do, do we secede like, the, like they did in, in the uh, 1770s 
and, and they say we're, we're out of here. That's, that's our natural right to do that. Well, there's a moderate middle ground, and that is the idea to say the states will stand up and say no to, to, to their employees, uh, to their creation. Remember, the states created the federal government. So when the federal government runs them up like this and tries to tell the states, that's like the, the child telling the parents what's going on. And we need to have that brought back into order. Uh, and then you can join up with organizations uh, like Panda and the Tenth Amendment Center and Campaign for Liberty and all these to fight indefinite detention and nullify this immoral and unconstitutional uh, legislation. Next, please. Okay, so Edmund Burke, all that's necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Next, please. All right, so there's that. And then as we go on, um, the, the, uh, Tom's bill, now he's, he pointed out it's on the floor of the Senate because they have to go think of these different versions and sometimes even with a slight difference in wording, then they have to pass it so they, they are exactly the same. Uh, now, uh, Tom's bill uh, tells the state employees and the state agencies that if they're on official business, they, they can't cooperate with any uh, federal attempts to abrogate our rights uh, un under this uh, horrible legislation. Okay, so uh, it, what's interesting is that the bill seems to be very popular among legislators. I mean, when it comes up for a vote, what you'll see is uh, unanimous or nearly unanimous um, votes in favor of it um, most of the time. But the, another interesting thing is that governors have not tended to sign this model legislation, which comes from the 10th Amendment Center. They had three different versions of it. Um, the state of Virginia was the first to pass it, and their governor, McDonald, signed it after he had got some pressure from the people. Uh, he later said he wasn't going to even uh, follow it, which is typical for these politicians. So we need to be vigilant, and we need to put pressure on all the time. Uh, in Arizona, the legislation was passed, and the Governor Brewer there vetoed it, apparently under pressure from Senator McCain. Oh, gee, oh, I'm amazing. God. All right. So anyway, uh, then we, we were working on getting this through uh, last year. In fact, Ray Perkins and I went up, I remember the last day, uh, we were up there and working with Tom, and talking to Senator Richard Bill, and gee, somehow it was pulled out. Uh, oh, gee, he didn't realize how important it was or something like that. Anyway, but it looks like it, it may well go through now because it's through the House, and apparently it's very popular in the Senate. Okay, and then if, now, will Governor Snyder sign it? It's a big question. We, we don't know. Okay. But, um, well, yeah, I mean, it, it would seem to be, uh, there would be a lot of, seem, it would seem to be veto proof with those kinds of numbers. So I don't know if he doesn't sign or he vetoes it, maybe some of the Republicans, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. But, here, here, so that, that's, that's the first step. So now, the other thought that comes up is, as we're looking at things uh, like this, what if the Fed say, okay, fine, um, Michigan says they won't cooperate? Well, maybe we'll send our people to do that as, as on our own. So what's, is there another step we can take to protect us? Well, James Madison, our fourth president, talked about interposition. The state actually standing up saying to the Feds, no. Um, and in fact, we will we will actively fight if we if we need to. We will protect our people. This is what happened in 1798 when President Adams, uh, the second constitutional president uh, after Washington. But of course, there were a number of them under the Articles of Confederation. President Adams got through the Alien and Sedition Acts, which said that if you criticized him, or made fun of him, or any of his people, and you were not a congressman or a senator on the floor of the legislature, that he would have you arrested. Thomas Jefferson, who was his vice president, because they didn't have tickets, See, there were two candidates, and Jefferson came in second, so he was the vice president, was outraged. Jefferson said, uh, th th you cannot do this. Adam said, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, a fair minded person, so I'll make an adjustment. They can criticize one person, they can criticize the vice president. Jeff <laughs> <laughs> Jefferson said, oh, that's hilarious, goes, up, goes off to Kentucky, and he wrote the Kentucky Resolves of 1798. His friend James Madison, went off to Virginia to write the Virginia Resolves of 1798. Now what's interesting is Jefferson and Madison didn't always have the same uh, political philosophies on things, but they, they certainly agreed on this. And, and Madison, to his credit, by the way, when it came to the Bill of Rights, even though he was on the other side of that, when they promised that they would do it, even though some people said, well, forget about it now that we get the Constitution ratified, uh, Madison said, because it was a condition of the ratification, he said, we, we need to do that, we're duty bound. All right, so Jefferson goes off and writes the, the Resolves of 1798, and he says, you can't do this, and we in Kentucky will fight. Now, they didn't have a strong standing army but they, for the federal government, but there was, of course, the state militia. Madison went off to Virginia and wrote the Virginia Resolves, and he said the same, essentially the same thing, but he used the phrase interposition. So Jefferson said nullification is the rightful remedy and the moderate middle ground. Madison said interposition is the duty. The states are duty-bound to arrest the evil through interposition. Those two states uh, stood up. Now, it, it took a long time for this process to work its way out. It finally, apparently, uh, was completed in the election of 1800. 
Interestingly, there was a congressman, uh, Congressman Lyons, uh, I believe from Vermont, who was arrested because he did give a speech criticizing the, the government, criticizing the administration. They threw him in jail. He ran for Congress in the election of 1800. He was, he was elected by a two-to-one margin from his jail cell. <laughs> Apparently the vote was so close between Jefferson and Adams, this is supposed to be like one of the most bitter campaigns in American history. It came down to the vote in Congress. And then it came down finally to one congressman. Oh my God. Congressman Lyons casting the vote from the jail uh, for Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and it was because these, these people who were brave patriots who had taken up arms to defend their rights against the British Empire who had seceded from the British Empire. So we don't want to secede right now, even though that's our right, but we will nullify this nullification of our rights. We will interpose. And, and so they kept that fight up. Michigan later did the same thing uh, against the Fugitive Slave Act. So now, you say, okay, well, that's great. What, what, what's our next step? Um, there, there is legislation that has been devised. Again, it's not campaign for liberty, so I, I have to give that disclaimer. But the Patriot Coalition, uh, which is a group of the Intolerable Acts, and also um, the Old Keepers have legislation called Restoring Constitutional Governance Act. And we have uh, copies of that here, which we can pass out. And it, it shows all the different ways, again, it lists ways the federal constitution, the constitution for the United States that was designed by the states and it, the agreement among the states as to how their creation would operate. Uh, that's violated by NDAA. It also talks about ways in which uh, the Michigan Declaration of Rights, which is essentially the Bill of Rights the state of Michigan passed as, as part of the Constitution for Michigan and the Michigan Constitution Oath of Office itself, how all these things are violated. And so what's happening is around the country, we're seeing on issue after issue, like we saw on gun control, we heard at our last meeting, what's happened is now we have states that are actually putting in um, provisions for penalties for federal agents or for state employees who violate the rights of the people. And so using the Ninth Amendment and the Tenth Amendment and following through with the oath of office to uphold the Constitution and defend the rights of the people, we, we are now seeing a growing movement. It's even happening here in Michigan on Obamacare. This NDAA situation would be a great one to build on the work that Tom's been doing in the legislature and, and to take the next step. There's a lot of work that's got to be done to educate the people. We talk about that all the time. It also to, to mobilize and, and confront politicians who will say, oh no, what the federal government says go, and that's federalism. No, it's not. They're wrong about that. This is a prime example of why we have to fight that wrong thinking. And the good news is, whether it's Obamacare or, or the right to self-defense and to be armed for self-defense or, or to be protected um, in terms of attempts to take away your uh, rights to fair uh, process, due process and, and civilian trial and, and, and to support posse comitatus and to not have the military come in here into this country and use the law of war and destroy the Constitution. All of these are reasons why we need to keep fighting this fight. And um, after Governor Snyder hopefully signs uh, Tom's bill, then also we, we begin the next step. Uh, and even if he doesn't sign it, we begin the next step to say the state of Michigan needs to do its duty, which these people all take an oath to do and to protect their rights and the safety and the security and the liberty of the people of this great state of Michigan. Thank you very much.